want to start with some rather basic things. You can't see it if you don't know it. But 2010 was actually the hottest year ever recorded. I have this confirmed two days ago from some of the researchers doing research on this. And although it's rather banal, I think that it's rather important to emphasize the obvious now and then. Somehow, man is a strange creature. We can imagine a lot of things. But yet, when it's snowing outside, it's as if problems that we don't like maybe just disappeared by themselves. While this summer in Pakistan, this summer, Mr. President Putin, uh, Prime Minister Putin in, in Russia, right now I would take it in Brisbane and a lot of other areas in Australia, people start to realize when it's coming close, when it's there, that something strange is happening and they start to reflect. Just a few facts to sort of set the scene of what kind of challenges we're in for. I read a few days ago that where we globally now have 800 million cars, in the next 20 to 25 years, that amount will double into 1.6 billion cars. I mean, you don't have to be a climate expert to understand that we are in for some challenges just in such a field for numerous reasons, not just environmental reasons. We know that when my children are now my age, we will be 9 billion on planet Earth. I mean, you don't have, do you, to live through it, to know that if we continue the present way of creating our growth, then 9 billion people spells trouble. I also heard from a, another professor yesterday that these 9 billion people are estimated to eat like 12 billion because the average income will come up and the consumer patterns will, will change. And final thing, it's very, very easy to make the prognosis that with very, very great certainty, for instance, oil prices will skyrocket in the next decades. There is no way that they won't. Actually, I read a rather interesting article, maybe some of you saw it, but it was very small in the Financial uh, Times yesterday, that right now coal prices are the highest for several years. Why? Because of the floodings in Australia. Not flooding the coal mines, but it's not possible to transport the coals from the mines to ship them. Isn't that really an ironic story? So, again, you do not have to be convinced about climate science to know that we are in for some very, very expensive solutions if we just continue business as usual uh, in many, many ways. Uh, we already we're already seeing it last weekend, I was in, in Denmark, and all over the place it was, uh, the news was, now gasoline prices are the highest ever. That was just last weekend. In Financial Times last Tuesday, you could see that the increased bill for imported oil in the OECD countries last year, year of 2010, the hottest year ever, the increased bill for oil was equivalent to 0.5% of the OECD countries' GDP. And in Europe alone, we paid 70 billion US dollars more for imported oil last year than we did the year before. I mean, it's just the kind of economic discussions, economic choices that we normally do not discuss. That's just bills that we pay, whereas if we discuss whether we should invest 10 or 20 or 30 billion more in innovative solutions, then it's a huge discussion. There is some irony in that, I think. So my question is just, do we really have to literally feel the heat before we understand that for many reasons, it is not only a good idea, but it's imperative to pursue a more sustainable, a more green kind of growth. Actually, I think 
that that's the point that the whole debate on climate over the recent three, four, five years has helped drive home. Today, climate is about much more than climate. For instance, it made suddenly energy policy sexy. That was not the case five or 10 years ago, I tell you. <laughs> um, I know that to sort of start my intervention here by repeating these things for you is probably unnecessary because if you were not already aware of this, you would probably not be here. Uh, but I just state it because I think that there are still some basic information and some basic thinking that we need to communicate out there. Also that the climate issue is not just about two degrees and 450 ppm. It's about our growth model. It's about how to make innovative solutions, more resource efficient solutions, how to create jobs, how to increase energy security. And I think it's this broader narrative that we need to focus on. That's of course also what international climate negotiations like Cancun basically is about. And I'm not going to dwell a lot on the results of Cancun because I take it that those of you who want to know the details, you know them already. But just very, very briefly, I think that what was politically interesting was that we managed to sort of save multilateralism. It was proved that somehow multilateralism can still provide results. Sometimes it takes a bit longer than some of us would like, uh, like it to, but actually it provided results. Also because people knew, and the parties knew, that if they did not, well, one thing is that the only thing that you had, the only forum where you agreed to negotiate these things, then it would die out, not in the formal sense, but, but in reality. And nobody really wanted to get the blame not to deliver. So we actually got all the elements from the Copenhagen Accord, the financial part, the two degrees, and the uh, new language on MRV, the pledges, all of this is now anchored in the formal uh, UN documents. But also we got the adaptation framework, the technology, the forestry part, and we got substantial progress when it comes to MRV. To be honest with you, I think that was probably the most interesting new achievement in Cancun, that we agreed to increase substantially the transparency in, in this area, and, and I think that was a rather big achievement. There are many reasons why we achieved this. As I said, there were some lessons learned and nobody wanted to take the blame. Everybody knew that if they sort of didn't deliver this time, the process risked dying. The Mexican president did a very, very fine job, and they also had a number of very, very good allies uh, trying to manage expectations and give specific input as to what could the solutions be. And I would say that among those allies very much were uh, the, the Europeans, uh, the, the European Union. We suggested already in March 2010 what we call a stepwise approach. We came up with a lot of very specific input, also in very specific areas. And much of what you see in the text is actually inspired from what Europe came up with. And I think that strategically it meant a lot that we were open to take a second commitment period. You could also put it this way, is if everybody had said, no, we are not, then I don't think you would have an agreement with all the countries on board except for Bolivia. So I would just briefly say that our European strategy produced results. We also managed this time to speak with one voice. That was very, very important, seen from a European perspective. So now, what now? Well, Durban is coming up. There is a very, very huge work program, lots of details, lots of implementation to be done. And of course, there will be a lot of discussions about what should happen after 2012, how to add on on the pledges, lots of things. The work will continue. And six months after uh, Durban in December, we will have the Rio Plus 20 conference where the whole world will have to define what in the 21st century does it actually mean to talk about sustainable growth. So there will also be an opportunity there to set some global targets. But enough about these international negotiations because this is very important for many reasons, you know them, but it's not enough. Now municipalities, regions, countries, 
sectors will have actually to start doing things, of course also in Europe. And the last part of my intervention will sort of focus on some of these key things we have to do. Last year in May, in a communication, the Commission uh, addressed this issue, if we should step up from 20% to 30%, what would be the cost, what would be the co-benefits, uh, what would it require, what are the challenges? And in that communication, we actually introduced one new way of seeing things. Yes, Europe links going beyond 20% to what are others doing, and in that sense, to the international negotiations. Where are they heading? To try to use this going up to give some leverage in, in the negotiations. But we introduced a new thing. The European self-interest that ambitious climate targets, energy targets, can stimulate innovation, growth, job creation. I think that was a rather important sort of change, partly change in, in, in the way we see this. That was a new dimension. And in the Commission's work program for 2020, resource efficiency and the low carbon society is made so one of the flagships. It's a pillar in whatever we do. And in the new commission, we really work like mainstreaming. It's not so that only the climate action commissioner will have to be responsible for mainstreaming. That's my sort of key responsibility. But I mean, I cannot do that if the transport commissioner would not also think that, of course, whatever he does when we are talking about, for instance, 2050, that when he comes up with his white paper from transport, when the energy commissioner comes up with the energy efficiency action plan, and when we come up in for, with the 2050 roadmap for a low carbon society, then these things will have to be seen in sort of a holistic uh, approach. That's what this commission think about mainstream, that we work together in innovation, in budgets, things like that. We could come back to a lot of the details. And this is not something fancy thing coming years from now. This is what we are presenting in less than two months from, from the Commission. And by the way, in this 2050 roadmap, you will also be able to see where do we then have to be in 2030. I mean, it's not always that difficult to discuss what's going to happen 40 years from now, but you have to get on, on track to be there. And then we've also had the discussion on how to move uh, beyond 20%. Is that possible? As you know, a number of member states now have said, yes, they think so, and they think that would be the right policy. United Kingdom, France, Germany, Denmark, Finland, Spain, and more, is, uh, more are on their way. But that's also a discussion we are going to have here in the first half of this year. I know that some industries, they would have this fear. If we are really being ambitious in this field, wouldn't it then harm our competitiveness? What about carbon leakage? I think it's very important to realize that carbon leakage is not a one-way street. There are many ways of losing jobs. There are also some inevitable ways to lose jobs. I mean, Europe has for decades lost jobs, functions that we do not have in our societies anymore, things that have been outsourced, so it's not a question of whether you will lose jobs. You always lose some jobs. Things change. But the big issue is, do you create new areas, new strongholds, where you can also create new jobs? And I think that if you are too complacent as a region, if you are too hesitant, then you can also risk losing jobs in the new geostrategic picture where we can see some of our competitors actually embracing this agenda of energy efficiency, resource efficient solutions, new technologies, innovation, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to dwell a lot with the next Chinese five-year plan. I would just say that I believe that many Europeans will be in for a surprise, not to talk about many Americans, when they see the next five-year plan where if we take what we have been able to read about it and seen from public announcements, there will be carbon targets, there will be a pricing mechanism for energy somehow, probably there will be pilot projects for some kind of cap and trade system. And we can see that when we look at the new industrial priority areas for industrial innovation, 
There are seven areas, and almost all of them are related to energy, environment, and climate. That's just the reality. And by the way, it's also the reality that in China they tripled investments in education over the last 10 years, and they are also sort of putting education and innovation forces into the areas we're talking about here. Through the Copenhagen Accord, around 80 countries uh, in the world has now set domestic CO2 reduction targets. Some real reduction, some deviation from business as usual, but basically 80 countries have now domestic targets. So not just talking about China, but also Korea, Brazil, Indonesia, Vietnam, many other countries. It is very clear to see that in an area where Europe used to be the undisputed front runner, our leadership is being challenged. I think that um, this market, uh, it's very, very important for our economies to continue to have a front runner position here. It's set to, some, some would say it will double the market for energy efficient products. It will double before 2020. Some argue HSBC, for instance, that it will triple to a combined value of $2.2 trillion in 2020. I think that it's rather obvious to have a strong run, front runner position in such a growing market is interesting for any economy. So finally, what can we then do? I think that we have a long history in the environmental field in Europe that proves, and also in the climate field, that proves that targets help getting things done. Targets help politicians to actually focus, keep focus, get things done, and get things done faster than would else have been the case. We need some pricing mechanisms. That's what the ETS system is basically about. But we also need, outside the ETS system, without the emissions trading system, to be able, to a higher degree, to price energy and resources. I saw that an American paper company has named me the EU's new tax commissioner. Um, so maybe that would be interesting, be an interesting portfolio, because I think that's one of the areas where we really need a paradigm shift. The big challenge in Europe is the high labor costs, among one of the reasons high taxation on labor. Maybe if we tax our energy and resources more, that would also benefit our overall model. I'm um, not going to dwell a lot with this, but just to put it very briefly, if we taxed more what we burn and less what we earn, I think that there is really room for a paradigm shift there. It's not going to come by in just one year or two years, but as a vision, we should tax less labor when we need people to work more and attract labor force, and we should tax more resources when we need uh, to focus on resource efficiency. So we need to have the price mechanism. The incentive must be there for invest in these areas and also for investors when they are looking where they need innovation, where do they want to, to put their money? It's very important that the incentive structure is right in this area. And then finally, we must also address innovation much more. And here I think we could do more at the European level. Recently, we had this new entrance reserve, as it's called with the technical expression, but it is surplus money from auctioning uh, that generates 4.5 billion euros, quite a load of money, and it goes into innovative energy efficient projects and CCS. I think that at the European level, we could get more output if we sometimes were better at pooling our resources in research and development, and particularly when it comes to demonstration projects. So that's one of the areas where I think we could get more added value at the European level by pooling our resources. I think finally, my very final point, that what we also need, now I mentioned targets, I would also mention standards, price mechanisms, and incentives, and investments in innovation as some of the key tools. But finally, then I also think that we must have a bit more future-oriented discussion on growth. 
Growth in the 21st century cannot only be GDP growth. What about depletion of nature, raw materials, the consequences to health, air quality, clean water? That kind of growth, I believe, is very, very important in the world of the 21st century. And there I think that our method so far to measure growth is probably very inadequate. So here a shift is necessary. Uh, and I think that the basic choice we are faced with in Europe is whether we want to be those who are delivering some of these transformational new solutions first so that we can gain from the transformation or we will hesitate, ponder, shake our hands, wait and see while others take over the front-runner position in this race. I really believe that to keep Europe in a winning position we need the targets, we need standards, we need to invest more in innovation, we need the positive incentives we need some other pricing mechanisms. And then finally, we need all stakeholders, including, of course, business, that can prove that it's not just something that some of us claim, that you can make an intelligent, fun, interesting, prosperous society through green solutions, that you can actually prove that it's not pure theory. Also, in the practical life, you can deliver the solutions. And that's where I think that to cooperate with business is absolutely key uh, if this is going to go from what you in the introduction call sort of just sort of, you didn't use this impression, but nice to have, but also that we can actually deliver on this. Uh, that's why I'm here today, and I hope you will have some good input that can inspire the further discussion. Thank you very much for your attention.